This lecture is part of an online course on category theory and will be about natural transformations between two functors. So I'll start with what may have been the motivating example. So here we're going to take the category of vector spaces over some field k. Now if v is a vector space then we can define a dual space um, uh, v star which is the hom over k from v to k. And let's make these spaces finite dimensional just to make things a little bit easier. And now we notice that v is isomorphic to its dual because v is finite dimensional. However, this isomorphism is not really natural. Um, in order to find an isomorphism from v to its dual, we might start by choosing a basis for v. Um, but there are lots of different ways to choose a base, and these are going to give you different isomorphisms from v to its dual. On the other hand, we also know that v is isomorphic to the dual of the dual of v, and this is natural. Um, so, for example, um, if we've got an element v in v and w in the dual of v, then um, v gives us the following element of the double dual. So um, we just define v of w to be w of v, and this makes v into a linear transformation on the dual of v. It's a little bit confusing, but rather trivial, really. Um, and the question is, what does this word natural mean? So I've sort of said it's natural, and it certainly seems to be natural in some sense, but the question is, can we give a rigorous mathematical definition of what it means for this to be natural, whereas this isn't? And this was answered by um, Eilenberg and MacLean as follows. Um, suppose you've got two vector spaces, V and W, and a linear transformation from V to W, and you've also got this map to its double dual, and we've got a map from between the double duals, and we've also got this natural map from W to its double dual. And the point is that this square commutes whenever you've got a linear transformation from V to W, and this is this is the key um, um, idea in order to define what this word natural means. So more. Um, so, so we can write this as follows. What we have is um, a diagram like this. We've got fv goes to f of w goes to gv goes to g of w, where f of v is the trivial functor taking v to itself, and g of v is the double dual functor. So what this gives is, a, is an example of a natural transformation from the identity functor to the double dual functor. Actually, it's not just a natural transformation. This is, um, in fact, a natural isomorphism um, from F to G. And what this means is that these maps here are isomorphisms and this square commutes. Um, if these maps aren't necessarily isomorphisms, but are just morphisms, then we call this a natural transformation. So a natural isomorphism is a special case of a natural transformation where these maps are the identity are, are, are isomorphisms. Um, so uh, let's give an example of this. Um, so uh, a typical example is the determinant. Now the determinant is a map from the general linear group over, that can be over a ring, to the non-zero elements of a ring R. Well, you notice that if you've got another ring S, then you get a map from 
the n by n matrices over R with non, with invertible determinant, the same matrices over S, and the determinant um, map goes like this. And this square commutes. And what this means is that determinant is a natural transformation from um, the first functor takes R to the general linear group of R, and the second functor takes R to the non-zero elements of R. Um, an important application of natural isomorphisms is to define equivalence of categories. Um, so we mentioned isomorphism of categories earlier. We said that two categories are isomorphic if there are functors between them that are inverses of each other. And we mentioned this is not a really a very useful notion. For example, suppose we take the map from vector space to the double dual. This is not an isomorphism from um, the category of vector space to the category of vector spaces. And it sort of looks as if it ought to be, because any vector space is certainly naturally isomorphic to its double dual. The trouble is not every vector space is a dual of another vector space. It's certainly isomorphic to the dual of another vector space, but it may not be exactly the same. So the condition about isomorphism of categories is a little bit too strong. Um, so what we um, do is we now define equivalence of categories. So, so, so first of all, we recall the definition of an isomorphism. So, so F is an isomorphism if Fg is the identity map of um, D and GF is is, is is the identity map from C to itself. And as I said, this, this is too strong. Um, so, so this is the condition of an isomorphism of categories. For equivalence, all we want is that FG is, a, there's a natural isomorphism from FD to the um, identity map. So we want this to be a natural isomorphism and similarly we want GF to be a, a natural, there should be a natural isomorphism to the identity of C. And now we can see that this map here is an, an equivalence. So sorry, I forgot to say that if we have a natural isomorphism, we, we say that F and G are equivalences of categories. And we say the two categories are, equival are equivalent. And now we see that taking V to its double dual is an equivalence of categories. Um, so so the, 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 the nice notion of two categories being essentially the same is to say they're equivalent because saying they're actually strictly isomorphic is just too strong. So there's a very nice example of an equivalence of categories called Gelfand duality. <clears throat> this is an equivalence of categories between the category of compact Hausdorff spaces and um, these things called commutative C star algebras. I guess I should say they should also have an identity. Um, well, actually, it's not quite an equivalence between these. It's an equivalence between one of these categories and the opposite of the other category, because this reverses arrows. And the way it works is as follows. If you've got a compact Hausdorff space X, um, you just map it to C of X, which is continuous complex functions on X. And this space turns out to be something called a commutative C star algebra with an identity, which basically means it's got a ring and a norm and these satisfy some nice conditions. And what Gelfand showed in categorical notation is that this is actually an equivalence of categories. Gelfand didn't state it like that because I think he, he actually constructed this before category theory was invented. So main problem is you've got to construct a map going the other way from commutative C star algebras to compact Hausdorff spaces. 
And Gelfand did that by taking the spectrum of the C star algebra, which is essentially the set of closed maximal ideals, and you put a topology on that. And these two maps aren't quite inverses of each other, but the composition of uh, one of these maps followed by the other is is naturally isomorphic to the identity functor, which is what you need for an equivalence of categories. Um, another example of um, a natural isomorphism, if you just take um, the tensor product of abelian groups, then we know that this group here is essentially the same as hom from A to hom B to C. Um, and what does essentially the same mean? Well, what it means is that these that there's a natural isomorphism between these two functors. The, these are each functors of three, three variables. Um, so uh, we can also make the set of functors between two categories. The functors from C to D form a category. And so this is getting really confusing. Functors turn out to be morphisms. They're not only morphisms, they're also objects of a category. And here the objects are going to be functors from C to D. And the morphisms are going to be natural transformations of functors. And then you can see that um, two functors are naturally isomorphic if and only if they're actually isomorphic in, the, in this category. That, that's just a trivial rephrasing of, of definitions. Um, this actually means the categories of all categories is something called a two category. Um, of course, as usual, the category of all categories doesn't quite exist, but never mind. Here we say a naught category is a set, and a one category is a category. Um, the morphisms from A to B is a zero category, in other words, just a set. And a two category, um, um, the morphisms from A to B... Uh, is a one category. In other words, the collection of morphisms has itself has the structure of a category. So the category of all categories is a two category because the morphisms between two categories, which are just functors, themselves form a category with natural transformations of functors being the morphisms. It's very confusing. And of course, you can form three categories where the morphisms from A to B is a two category. Um, it's a bit of a problem with all this that defining these turns out to be a real mess. Um, for instance, with two categories, um, suppose we have three categories, C, D and E, and suppose we have some functors from C to D and some functors from D to E. And suppose we've got natural transformations. So we might have natural transformations going like that and some more natural transformations going like that. Then you can compose these natural transformations in several ways. First of all, you can compose them vertically by first of all composing these two and composing these two. Or you can compose them horizontally because if you've got a natural transformation there and a natural transformation there, you get a natural transformation from that composition to that composition. And then we want lots of axioms. For instance, we want to say if we first compose these vertically and then compose them horizontally, it's the same as first composing them horizontally and then composing them vertically. And as you can imagine, it's a real headache trying to keep track of all the bookkeeping needed to define two categories and three categories. Um, in, in fact, the bookkeeping is so horrendous that most mathematicians stay clear of two categories if they possibly can. Um, so the study of this is sometimes called higher category theory, and you can even sort of take a sort of limit of it and define infinity categories or omega categories. Um, 
OK, next lecture, we'll be giving a particularly important application of um, natural isomorphisms of functors, which is to define adjoint functors.